Quentin Tarantino has a potential lead actor for his final film, The Movie Critic. A PR firm is apparently paying movie critics to boost Rotten Tomato scores. And The Nun 2 scares off competition and takes the number one spot at the box office. Let's break down this week's movie news. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to another episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast, and another episode of Movie News where we go through all of the industry news so you don't have to. We have a ton of new trailer releases, movie news announcements, some casting, and also a lot of films are premiering at the Venice Film Festival, so we'll keep you posted on some premieres, reactions, and also some film sales from domestic distributors. Yeah, and we let's get into the box office first, though. Oh, yeah. And The Nun, like I said, has terrified the competition, made $32 million its opening weekend, the number one movie at the box office right now. R-rated horror, people are, have a fever for it, clearly. I didn't realize how big the Nun franchise was. This is actually a big drop from the first Nun film. The first Nun movie made $56 million opening weekend. It's wild. And then three hundred and sixty-five. million. For its domestic, for its global run, isn't the nun? It's all connected to like the Conjuring. Annabelle franchise. Yeah, Annabelle and Conjuring franchise. It's the Conjuring franchise. Well, was, not the you didn't Annabelle let me franchise. finish the goddamn sentence, Anthony. I was gonna say Annabelle and Conjuring franchise, it's, but you just had to butt in before I said it. It's the Conjuring. He had franchise. to just butt in. Anyways, the nun two decimates competition. <laughs> the Equalizer three is in second place with eleven million dollars at the box office. I love the Equalizer three. Go see it. My Big Fat Greek Wedding disappoints with only $10 million in its opening weekend, right? Yeah. Were yeah. they expecting anything more than that? I guess. The I mean, third the first one? movie was so successful, but I mean, that was so long ago. That was ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's my like, God. We're so old. Like, it was like eight years ago, man. People don't forget. People don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> hey, remember that time you pissed your pants? <laughs> but um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, ironically, being famous for one of, it's one of the most successful films based on return on investment ever. And then it's dwindling, and I, there's just no interest in the franchise anymore. I mean... The poster is so bad. It's the, the most oh my Photoshop God. poster I've ever seen in my entire life. The poster of My Big Fat Greek Wedding. We're seeing it everywhere all over like malls and stuff in, uh, in LA. Theaters. And it's so photoshopped. It's making these people in their 60s look like they're 25. It's funny because their face, obviously gravity, wrinkles, your face and skin Change. sags down a little bit. And your face keeps growing. So they're, these older people, their faces, obviously the skin's there. You can't fix the skin, but like their wrinkles are gone. No wrinkles. So their, their face skin is just like gravity's affected it for 50 years, but it's so pristine and smooth. <laughs> it's like, what is, these don't look like humans. Like, apparently, according to the marketing of my big factory wedding, as you get older, your wrinkles disappear. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's terrible, Mark. It looks so bad. It might be the worst poster of the year. It's terrible. It's that bad. And then Jawan came in fourth place with $7 million at the global box office. And Barbie, don't worry, is still in the top five. Pulled in another $5 million. Anthony, looking like you're it's, it looks like going to hit that $1.5 billion. And it looks like it's going to finish with 1.4 tops. Sorry. It has really slowed down because of the new releases. And it looks like I'm not going to win the bet, man. And I'm I, just gonna, I, I, I don't gonna, hate to say I told you so. I was close though. You're close. I it was, you know, I threw, I took a shot. Winning's winning. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile. <laughs> I never said I almost beat you. No, but you said I almost had you. I was close. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. I almost, I almost had you versus. I almost had I you, close. man. I, I almost close. had you, bro. Same thing. Same thing. Different, completely different words. All of the words were different. <laughs> Every same single meaning, one of them. Same context, but. Uh, upcoming episodes of the show this week. We are dropping an episode on The Bear tomorrow on yes, Monday. Chef. Don't miss that because everyone's been trying to get us to watch The Bear. We finally did. We lo watched the first two seasons, loved it. And tomorrow's episode will be breaking down both seasons. And it was such a great experience. So finally got around to that. And then Thursday, we're going to finally do the Captain America trilogy. We've never done the trilogy before. Never. I don't yeah. even think we've talked about a Captain America movie before besides outside of like MCU episodes or... Avengers I don't think episodes. so at all either. We haven't I think even done we've Winter always, Soldier. We've, for the solo trilogies, we did Iron Man trilogy. Uh, that's the only other trilogy we've done outside of... Um, for MCU? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So We've we're only gonna, done Avengers movies, Yeah, basically. we're going to do the Captain America trilogy. It's something that we've always wanted to do, and might as well fucking do it. Why the fuck not? Remember the great days of, of Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeff. Yes, Jeff. <laughs> now, let's get into the mo movie news. So, Quentin Tarantino, we all know he's working on his last film, The Movie Critic which they hope to begin filming next year, dependent on the strikes. I remember an interview he had a couple months ago where he said he had the perfect actor in mind that could be really great for the role that he wrote. And everybody was like, oh, who's it going to be? 
News has come out that it was actually Paul Walter Hauser. Oh, it's, a, it's, uh, it's not news. It's, yeah, a it's rumor. rumors. It's a rumor. Rumors. And he, you've seen him in Blackbird, I, Tonya, Richard Jewell, and he also played one of Cruella's henchmen in the Cruella film adaptation, the live action one. He is an exceptional actor. Richard Jewell and I, Tonya are fantastic performances. I haven't seen Blackbird, but I know a few people who have seen Blackbird and they, he's say, really good in it. they say he's amazing. He's a really talented, unknown actor. I think it's a great choice. So this movie hopefully will be filming soon. Tarantino definitely is going to film in California. He said, I love shooting in California. I started directing movies here, and it is only fitting that I shoot my final motion picture in the cinema capital of the world. There is nothing like shooting in my hometown. The crews are the best I've ever worked with, and the locations are amazing. The producers and I are thrilled to be making number 10 in Los Angeles, and I, for one, hope this is true with with, uh Paul Walter Hauser, he's fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited to see if this is true news. And, I mean, there's a lot of rumors with the early stuff with his movie and people assuming they knew what it was going to be about. Yeah. So it's not confirmed, but it's a cool rumor. But if you haven't seen Richard Jewell, that's Clint Eastwood's film, It's he's amazing in it. I was shocked he didn't at least get an Oscar nomination for lead actor. He's that good. All right, we have some controversial news about a topic that we all assumed was happening with Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> and the scores not being accurate and... Something happening with critics because it's so odd when you see these movies that aren't that great getting such glowing reviews and like 98% fresh. You're like, 98% fresh. What really? the fuck's going on here? So, this isn't about Rotten Tomatoes controversy in terms of like the company. It's an, it's about a PR company that has been reportedly paying reviewers to boost Rotten Tomatoes scores and giving positive ratings on movies that may not deserve it. And Rotten Tomatoes apparently punished them. So the movie PR company Bunker 15 reportedly heckled and even paid reviewers for positive reviews of indie film Ophelia. And Rotten Tomatoes took notice. Back in 2018, a film PR company named Bunker 15 was responsible for the publicity of reimagined Shakespeare tale Ophelia. At the time of its release, Ophelia received a rotten 40% score on Rotten Tomatoes. Bunker 15 sought to change that by reaching out to lesser known critics to review the film as one reviewer exposed Ophelia would benefit from more input from different critics with some of them allegedly paid. As a result, Ophelia's Rotten Tomato score rose from 40% to 62%. This is a small example of something that I'm sure has been going on for years with much bigger films and more broadly across releases every year. Yeah, that's a great point. Bunker 15 is taking the heat right now, but if they're doing it, that means it's a commonality. I guarantee there's so many other firms and big companies doing this it's just that they got caught yeah Bunker it's just, 15 it's just got like caught. cheating in baseball everyone's yeah. doing it but like who gets get, caught who gets caught the idiot with the the the, shit, the pine tar in his hat yeah, and then the one team that gets caught everyone's like oh they're it, the bad guys it's only them it's, we're, we're not doing we're not, that no one's we would doing, never no one's cheat. cheating so i would say you're completely right if if bunker 15 this small pr company is doing it that just means they're the ones who got outed and everybody else is probably doing it in some capacity i would Fall say guy and the thing is, Rich, is, Rotten Tomatoes can be very confusing to the average um, user. Rotten Tomatoes, if you look at the score, it's not a score of the movie. So if you see the percentage of Rotten Tomatoes, if a movie is like 70... I, I use the prestige as an example on Twitter. So the prestige is 77% on Rotten Tomatoes. The 77% does not mean it's a 77 out of 100 in terms of the quality of the film. That percentage is just the number of critics who gave it a positive review. And a positive review is anything over 60. So that's not really a metric for the quality of the film. So you could have a film that's good and that everybody likes, but it could get 100% Rotten Tomatoes. But also the prestige deserves like 98%. Exactly. <laughs> so like terrible. A, a movie could have a 98% Rotten Tomato score, but that doesn't mean it's a 98 out of 100 in terms of quality. It just means that 98% of critics gave it a positive review. Where you, And then you can have a great film like The Prestige is a great example still of a film that is incredible, really well loved, but its Rotten Tomato score is actually pretty low considering its quality because just a... Uh, 23% of critics didn't give it a positive review. And so... A bunch of idiots. For real. The Rotten Tomato score is not a metric of quality. It's just a metric of how many percentage... What the percentage of critics who liked the movie gave it. And as it can be confusing when people see a high score. It's like, this is going to be like the best movie ever, right? Yeah. If, it's, if an IMD, IMDb score is a 9.8, then it's like, okay, this is like the fucking best movie ever. <laughs> but that's the problem with Rotten Tomatoes. They used to actually have... The rating metric out of 10. So it used to be critic score, audience score, and then it would have a, an average score out of 10. But they got rid of that. 
So you could see like a movie like The Prestige would have like a 77%, but then it would have like an 8.5 rating. They got rid of that because it, I think they wanted to make it so it was like harder to really understand what the metric was. So I, I wish they still had that, but it's gone. That's too bad. It'd be a lot more accurate to like yeah. IMDb of like what a movie actually is in terms exactly. of what people think about it. Let's move on to some more news. So Richard Linklater was recently talking about the modern state of cinema, and he said, It feels like it's gone with the wind or gone with the algorithm. Sometimes I'll talk to some of my contemporaries who I came up with during the 1990s and we'll go, Oh my God, we could never get that done today. So on the one hand, selfishly, you think, I guess I was born at the right time. I was able to participate in what always feels like the last good era for filmmaking. And then you hope for a better day. But man, the way distribution has fallen off, sadly, it's mostly just the audience. Is there a new generation that really values cinema anymore? That's the dark thought. And I really kind of connect with the sentiments. And obviously, we still get great cinema. But there is a massive dilution in quality of cinema with the streaming platforms just putting content out, just turning a lot of movies and a lot of their budgets into just content, background content. They expect you're watching a movie while being on your phone at home, and they don't really care anymore. And also in terms of when he said, is there is there a new generation that really values cinema anymore? That's also a uh, up-in-the-air question because when these great, incredible dramas or comedies or independent films that don't have the spectacle of the big movies come out, they rarely do well at all. And so it's a problem of like, are people, uh, is the mainstream audience really only interested in seeing big, huge spectacle and nothing else when they go to the movies? Horror. Horror is horror. still doing pretty well. Yeah, horror is doing well. But horror is, it's still a fantasy. It's, 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 yeah. It's still like, there's no such thing as a real nun killing kids. Hey, I'm sure it's a, happened a, a before. A nun demon killing kids. The demon part, the yeah. The demon. So, I mean, there's still a fantasy aspect to most horror films that takes it out of the realm of reality. And so it's still this kind of like a spectacle, fantastical thing. Whereas the human dramas, the human films, like he, really incredible films, whether they be comedy um, or dramas that lack any kind of fantasy or science fiction or whatever, those aren't making any money at the box office like they used to. I just Googled, has a nun ever killed a kid? And there are some stories. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's killed a kid. <laughs> Anthony's killed a kid. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it sucks. All right. We have a ton of news from the Venice Film Festival. First up, Poor Things. Yorgos Lanthimos film starring Emma Stone, one of our most anticipated films for the rest of the year coming out in December, premiered at the Venice Film Festival to rave reviews. Also, Emma, also Emma Stone and Yorgos Lanthimos already secretly filmed their next movie in Greece. It's going to be a much simpler, smaller scaled film than Poor Things, something he's more used to, obviously, with his other films, because Poor Things is very extravagant. But that's pretty wild that they've already filmed another movie. They must love working together to do, because... This is now three movies in just a handful of years. Yeah. That's awesome. I love them. All right. So also at Venice Film Festival, The Maestro premiered, The Killer premiered, and Ferrari also premiered. And Priscilla. Priscilla as well. They all got great reviews. The The Maestro got great reviews. Ferrari had, from what I could tell, kind of mixed reviews from critics and audiences, but nothing out is online yet. There were also some sales for distribution, so... Uh, Neon bought both Ferrari and Origin for wow. for domestic distribution. Giannis and Sideshow Pictures bought Ryusuke Amaguchi's Evil Does Not Exist um, for di domestic distribution. And A24, unsurprisingly, purchased Sofia Coppola's Priscilla for domestic pr distribution. And Sofia Coppola's Priscilla, also great reviews, has been pushed a week from its original release date of October 27th to all the way it's November 3rd, so it's not that big of a deal. So they're avoiding Swift. Yeah, they're everyone's avoiding Taylor. <laughs> everyone's avoiding Taylor Swift. There was another movie that also pushed back its date uh, by a week that was coming out at the end of September, and now they're pushed it to the first week of October. There are a ton of new trailers we got to talk about. First of all, my favorite of the week, The Bike Riders. This movie looks terrific. The new film from Jeff Nichols starring Austin Butler, Jody Comer, and Tom Hardy based on true events of this biker gang. It looks awesome. Poster's excellent as well, but this trailer blew my hair back. I was pleasantly surprised. Obviously, I had really solid expectations for, you know, he's such a great director and this great cast, but 
I really like this trailer, man. It looks sick. And Austin got rid of his Elvis voice. Pretty much, the mysteries, yeah. The mystery's... Yeah. I think everyone needs to stop talking break. about it. Yeah, yeah it's then, gone. I mean, then when he's Fade Routha for Dune next year, everyone's going to be like, all right. Unless he's like, hey, yeah, hey, <laughs> hey, Paul Traders. Hey, Paul. Paul, Paul Traders. I'm fun. supposed to be the one. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take over. I'm going <laughs> to take over Dune for me. Rackus is mine. I love Jeff Nichols. He's a fantastic director. This looks really excellent. It's got a cool sculpt, cool story. Also, Boyd Holbrook's in this film as well as... What's the, the name of the actor from uh, Boondock Saints in Walking Dead? I'm sorry. I always forget his name. Oh, um. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Norman Reedus. Norman Reedus. He has, like, he's that biker with, like, the crazy long hair yeah. and ridiculously, like, gross looking teeth. Like, that's Norman Reedus. Damn. So it looks like he's, like, disappeared into a role. Michael Shannon's in there, too. So the cast looks excellent. And the, yeah, the Shannon. accents are great. Yeah. Tom Hardy and Jodie Comer. Jodie Comer looks amazing in this movie. She is so talented. It didn't even sound anything like her. She's so good. They were getting a lot of like hate on Twitter about their accents. I'm like, you realize people from that don't live in metropolitan cities in America generally have accents. They sound a lot different. Trust yeah, me. I mean, in, especially in the Midwest, like that. She, she's doing that great Midwest. I mean, have you seen Fargo? <laughs> it's like if you watched Fargo and made fun of the accents. It's People need to get off, get off your phones. Go go see something. <laughs> there are other people out there that talk differently than you. I love the accent. I think Jody Comer's accent was great, and Tom Hardy's sounded really interesting. Because you want him to, you want them to sound different every movie. Yeah, you want them to be like different. It doesn't have to be the same American accent every time. True. And so I think the accents sound really cool, and I'm I'm excited for the film. We got a trailer for The Boy and the Heron, which. We weren't supposed to get a trailer for. This is Hayao Miyazaki's supposedly last film, which confirmed it's not his last film anymore. So lots of weird marketing. I'm not fucking leaving! So first, they weren't going <laughs> to release a trailer for this film. But now they released a trailer for this film. It looks sensational. Yeah. It looks incredible. And I also, think they realize American audiences want the trailer, probably. Or audience in general. Yeah. Maybe this was their plan the whole time to say we're not going to release a trailer, then like increase demand for a trailer, and then finally drop a trailer. Well, it performed well in the Asian market That's already. what I mean. Yeah. You know, I think maybe, maybe this was all part of it. But, it's all part of the plan. And it's no longer going to be Miyazaki's final film. So, like, so much, so many mixed signals. Maybe they're just here. like, it's like when a rapper retires and then they and drop they, an album the next year. Yeah, and then they unretire. <laughs> it's just marketing. It's all marketing, man. It's like how Tom Brady retired, then he dropped the TV, uh, Brady clothing line. Like when line. Logic retired two years ago, I'm like, he's not, he's not retired. He's coming back. He's like 34. <laughs> He's not retiring. He's not gonna never rap again for six years. Dude makes two albums a year. Like, of course he's gonna come back. He's just selling gear. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, Brady's just selling merch. Yeah. Um. And Guillermo del Toro called Hayao Miyazaki the Mozart of his time. He has changed the medium. Very sweet. High praise. Also, speaking of high praise, Kenneth Branagh's new Hercule Poirot film, A Haunting in Venice, has received excellent early reactions from critics and early screeners. People are calling it the best film of his franchise of the adaptations of the Agatha Christie novels. I watched the new trailer last week. It looks fucking awesome. I can't wait to see this movie. I love the Hercule Perot films already. I think he's done a really wonderful job with Death of the Nile and Murder on the Orient Express adaptations. This one looks really fantastic. It looks like a really cool horror movie, too. So I'm really excited to see this film. Everyone's shooting in Italy, man. It's yeah. great. Italy's so hot this so year. So hot in 2023. Holy <laughs> shit. Everyone's, every fucking movie's in Italy. It's crazy. <laughs> it's fucking... The although boy, The Boy and the Heron's in Italy. This, <laughs> it's funny, though, because there are never Italians in the movie. Yeah, it's pretty ironic. <laughs> like we, got, we got, like, Tina Fey. And, and we got Denzel. <laughs> we got the Fast and Furious crew. We got the Mission Impossible crew. There's no Italians in these movies. Uh, the Equalizer had Italians. I'll give it that. Okay, but the lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we got some mediocre trailers. So we got one, a new Netflix movie called Pain Hustlers, starring Emily Blunt and Chris Evans. It stars a woman who, after losing her job, struggles to raise her daughter, takes a job out of desperation. She begins to work at a failing pharmaceutical startup. But what she doesn't anticipate is a dangerous racketeering scheme she suddenly entered. So it's about big pharma and I'm sure hoodwinking consumers and uh -huh. investors with medications and prescriptions. It looks fine. It's just like, dude, these Netflix movies all look the same. They all look like the Unless same Unless it's made movie. by an outdoor director. Yeah, yeah, and even if you have Emily Blunt and Chris Evans, the trailer, I'm just like, it looks like every other Netflix movie. It, it literally, it feels like the Dumb, dumb Money trailer as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that one looks a little better, but it just it didn't, didn't do it for didn't, me. Didn't, yeah, it didn't, didn't blow my hair back. Didn't blow your hair back. No. Nah. It's all right, man. Not everything has to. Speaking of trailers, still, Godzilla Minus One, the new Apple TV series from filmmaker Takashi Yamazaki, has released its first trailer showcasing 
giant monsters as well as Kurt Russell and Wyatt Russell playing the same character over several decades. So Wyatt Russell will play the younger version of this character during the early days of the Monarch organization. And then Kurt Russell will play an older version of the character. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see father and son play the same role. It's only happened a handful of times, but it looks really cool. Um, you are inaccurate. So you're talking about uh, Godzilla, but you're talking about Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Uh -huh. That's different. Uh -huh. So this is Godzilla Minus One. It's an Apple TV movie from filmmaker Takashi Yamazaki. It takes place in the 1950s. Oh. So it's post-World War. Oh, they're you, doing two. So all you had to do, Anthony, was read what I wrote. But you decided not to. You went off script. I went off script. And just made something so, up. So the Russell's one is called Monarch? Yeah, so they're making a whole monster universe uh -huh. of like Godzilla movies and monster movies. So gotcha. Godzilla Minus One is different than Mon Mon a Monarch Legacy of Monsters, oh. which is the one with Kurt Russell and his son. Oh. So Godzilla Minus One is a dark, serious take on Godzilla. You know, I'm just going to read the script that I wrote. If you that, could. If that's cool with you. You could. You, know, you, you could have done that, but <laughs> it's a serious take on Godzilla. Imagine once more as a manifestation of nuclear terror that shook Japan at the end of World War II. It actually looks really solid. It's a basically a destruction movie, but like the metaphor of Godzilla being a nuclear weapon. It's pretty interesting. So get ready for more, more Godzilla movies and content. Obviously, it's never going to stop. But uh, it's inter Apple TV was like the, we're buying the Godzilla property. It's interesting that they, they, they chose that one. It makes money, man. People yeah. love it. Yeah, true, true. So, do you want to do the next one and read what I wrote? I would love to. Or do you want to make something up? I might. I might. <laughs> I might put it in my own words. <laughs> I might. All right. There's another horror trailer for Thanksgiving. Eli Roth's holiday horror movie starring Addison Rae is about a killer carving his way through a small town on Thanksgiving, which is a feature-length adaptation of the parody slasher trailer he made for 2007's Grindhouse double feature. So this looks like a, like a fun, just horror movie. And Thanksgiving, I think pairing Thanksgiving with horror and slashers seems like a fun idea. Yeah, and it seems like they're trying to make this new horror icon. The, the design of the character is really interesting. We got some glimpses of him in the trailer, but there's a poster of it. And it's basically, the look is a pilgrim, like a dark, evil pilgrim with this big-ass axe <laughs> with blood all over it. <laughs> It's ridiculous. The, the Thanksgiving genre is pretty thin, so I mean, why not take advantage? I mean, what is? I mean, how many Thanksgiving movies are there? Not that many. Like two. <laughs> no, there's a couple. Yes. But they're usually like family dramas or family comedies. Yeah, there's a few. There's a few. Back to the there's future th days. Coming no, soon. we need more. We need more Thanksgiving sci-fi movies. Yeah, what we, we, we really do. We're lacking. Anyways, Back to the Future Day is coming soon on October 21st. The film will play in theaters for one night only. It's pretty exciting stuff. So Fuck yeah, let's get your do tickets, it. man, if you want to see it. it. See it in theaters. Also, for Priscilla, Sophia. Copel I already got this, so oh, yeah. move on down to the next one. <laughs> You're good. The Crow is finally getting rebooted again. We'll see if this happens or not. It's, it's been 10 years. It's happening. So The Crow is picked up at Lionsgate on an eight-figure eight deal, and it's going to star Bill Skarsgård as The Crow, as well as FKA Twigs as the co-lead. Yeah, so, so she'll be playing... The fiancé of Eric Draven, the crow, famously played by Brendan Lee in 1993. We'll see, if, we'll see if it happens because, you know, all these crow reboots, they've gone through so many actors the last, like, five years. Momo was attached to it for years. Yeah. So we'll see if it actually goes through. Although this is a new company working on it. Lionsgate just bought it. Dude, it's going to get made. Yeah, I think it's, so. They, they literally, it's, it's going to happen. Yeah. It's already, like, I think going in pre-production. Man, Skarsgård. Was, was probably going to yeah. go in. Skarsgård's, like, making a career out of wearing, like, makeup and prosthetics in a way. And doing weird faces. <laughs> weird faces. <laughs> hey, every generation has one of those. <laughs> All right, the final bit of news. We have a Stray video game movie adaptation. So Stray was this video game where you just walk around as a cat, right? Yeah, so it's a 2022 video game. Was it an app or was it like on a no, console? No, it's a video game. So Annapurna Pictures, they also have a video game division. So Annapurna has been a great film production company for the last 10 years or so. They've made films. They've produced films for like Spike Jones, for Paul Thomas Anderson, for like a bunch of great filmmakers, Catherine Bigelow. And so they also have a video game division, which has been making video games. And so Stray was, one of, was their most successful one so far. So Stray follows the adventuring life of a stray cat who accidentally falls into a mysterious walled city inhabited by machines, robots, and mutant bacteria. The cat seeks to leave the city and return to the surface, aided by drone companion B12. Stray was one of the highest rated video games of 2022 and won a bunch of rewards. And 
this is going to be most likely a animated adaptation like their most recent film, The Mona, which was a really well-received, successful animated film that came out a couple months ago by Annapurna Pictures. And so it looks like they might go in that direction with the adaptation. Yeah. <laughs> Very cute. A bunch of people sent me the game, like, footage. Is like, it, you, you got to get this game. Is it good? Does it look cool? Yeah, it looks cool. Like, you're just cat, like, walking around and stuff, <laughs> jumping on roofs. And, can you, like, yeah, you can climb and, and jump Yeah, and stuff. just walking on roofs and, like, doing all sorts of shit. That's pretty fun. Cats are great climbers. Yeah, never. Yeah, they yeah. are. They're, they're <laughs> Juno's on the roof all the time. Yeah, he's just, they just like hop up on shit like nothing. But uh, Annapurna, they've made some really great films, but I think video games were a smart decision for them to make some extra revenue because, as great as their movies are, they rarely make money and they they make expensive movies for great filmmakers. I love Annapurna because they give my favorite filmmakers all the money they want yeah PTA movies don't make a lot at the box yeah, office I, <laughs> they funded three PTA movies and then they're like yeah can you like go somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we lost money on every one of those and Herod Vice didn't make any money he loved Sorry. it but like yeah no one saw it <laughs> facts man but G- gotta keep the lights on but yeah this sounds interesting it's funny they make PTA movies and then they also make a video game about a cat <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do you gotta diversify your revenue streams. Multiple sources. That's how you do it, everybody. That's how you do it. That's how you do we it. should make a video game. What would it be of? I don't know. We'll get to think of it. We should make a video game where you're just podcasters. <laughs> 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 you just sit at a pods. chair. You, you just it's sit at a chair. Pods. And you just you just talk and you do prompts. You play as us. Yeah. <laughs> It's RPG conversation, <laughs> dialogue boxes only. You're so, so you want to make an RPG of our life? Basically. Go to the gym, go grocery shopping, <laughs> go to barcade. Hey man, I do other things. <laughs> I do other things. Edit and podcast. It sounds things. like a, a laugh riot of a video game. I do game. other things. <laughs> yeah, you run. You, yeah, I do other things. You can, anyway. you can run as James. <laughs> yeah, I'll make it through L.A. <laughs> <laughs> James running in L.A. <laughs> It'll just be me, <laughs> shirtless and short shorts, <laughs> running all over Los Angeles, <laughs> chewing gum. <laughs> I think people would play that. <laughs> I think you would play that. <laughs> I wouldn't even run anymore. I just play the game of me running. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's so true. Yeah, I got ten miles in this morning <laughs> on the game. <laughs> this is it's a simulator. It's not a game. It's a simulator. I just, I got the miles in. <laughs> Since I burned 600 calories. Yeah, I'm going to do a 10K tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's funny. All right, that wraps movie news. Again, episodes this week. We're doing The Bear tomorrow. Carmi, we're going to talk all about him and his crew down in Chicago as they try to get the beef going and open up The Bear by season two, which is an excellent show again. And then Thursday, we're going to do our Captain America trilogy episode. Finally going to talk about those great films because we I love Winter Soldier. I love Civil War. I love... First Avenger, they're great movies. Yeah, yeah. First Avenger's pretty good. Winter Soldier, that's what like really got me like hooked into the MCU after Iron Man, obviously. But I was like, it blew your hair back. Yeah, I think Captain America. You became, talk about it every day. He became my. I think he became my favorite MCU character because that movie made him just cool. So cool. Made him a, made him a cool guy. Made him badass. <laughs> and then uh, obviously we'll be letterbox recap on Tuesday. Oh yeah, I, I've watched some movies already. This oh I gotta uh, catch up. I've watched we, a couple. We watched The Bear a lot, so yeah, I'm trying to get my numbers up. Yeah, I can't. I can't have less than ten movies on my letterbox yeah, I mean, you, recap. You, you better fucking cancel <laughs> some gotta, plans. I get a marathon it. Sorry, I can't go out tonight. I gotta watch seven movies. <laughs> Pretty busy night. <laughs> I can't let James beat me on letterbox it's, recap. It's for work. I gotta clock in. <laughs> Um, the best way is to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to share us with your movie lover friends and family members. Let them know about this show. It's the best way for our podcast to grow as well as leaving those five-star reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We love to read the written reviews on Apple Podcasts. Those help us get seen by new listeners on the platforms. And you can also become a patron today at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button as well. Notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.